and welcome to Community Matters, a podcast from the Canadian Association of Community Health Centres. I'm your host, Hilary Leblanc. On this episode of the podcast, I am joined by Beverly Sutterman from Cowichan Women's Health Collective, a CHC based in Duncan, British Columbia, and Ellen Mitchell, the systems navigator at Cedars Branches, which is a shelter for women operated by Cowichan Women Against Violence Society. Um, we're also joined by Samreen Hector, who is the manager for peers, volunteers, and practicum students at Etira Women's Resource Society and the Maxine Wright Community Health Center in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Cowichan Women's Health Collective and Etira Women's Resource Society Maxine Wright Community Health Center both received grants for our systems navigation project, also known as the SNAP project. Um, and uh, Cowichan was able to partner with the Cowichan Women Against Violence Society to make all of these projects a reality. Through this SNAP project, um, CHCs have been able to increase their efforts to improve health and social systems navigation access, which strengthens Canada's healthcare landscape, eliminates health disparities while improving population health outcomes. Wow, we get, got through that. How are you all doing today? <laughs> That was a mouthful, Hillary. <laughs> it was. It was. I'm happy that our BC Collective coming together has like the longest titles, but it's a Friday and I'm so happy to have the three of you here. You're all doing well today. Yes. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Hel- thank you, Hillary, for such a warm introduction. Thank you. No, no worries. Thank you all for being here. So excited to hear more about the SNAP project. Um, Beverly, I'll start with you. If you can talk us through Cowichan CHC, um, the community that you serve out in Duncan, BC, and the the programs that you offer. Sure, absolutely. Happy to do so. We are situated in the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples uh, in the city of Duncan, which is one of the smallest cities in Canada. And we have a very high population percentage of the population that is Indigenous here. Um, So Cowichan Women's Health Collective is an emerging community health centre. So we do not yet have a physical space. Um, And so our programming is being offered through Cowichan Women Against Violence Society and alongside and in partnership with the Primary Care Network. The primary care network made one of its nurse practitioners available to the shelter, the Cedar Branches shelter one day a week. Uh, And CWHC was able to assist with the funding for the system navigator position and the evaluation components for the SNAP project. Um, C-WAVE, so I'll use that abbreviation for Couch Women Against Violence Society. C-WAVE provided the office space and the equipment for the nurse practitioner and C-WAVE is committed to maintaining the system navigator position after the SNAP funding is finished, largely because the value of the service was anticipated even before the funding came in and before the staff member was hired. And so Ellen, I'm just wondering if you wanna kind of give a context of the setting for the program where it takes place. Sure, thanks. Um, So Cedar Branches uh, is a women only shelter and we have 24 beds, which includes four drop-in beds that it kind of, it depends on the weather. Sometimes there's two people, sometimes there's four people. We leave that to the discretion of the overnight staff. Um, And we're typically full, we have wait lists, um, and we operate under Couch and Women Against Violence Society. It's a low barrier shelter as well. So women who are actively using um, can come here and it's women only. Women only. Thank you so much for that for that wonderful overview. Um, Samreen, I'll pass it off to you next if you want to talk a little bit about the Oteria Women's Resource Society and the Maxine Wright Community Health Center the population that you serve in uh, Vancouver. Uh, we have, I will say, we have had the privilege of speaking to Oteria staff in the past, and there is another episode uh, with one of your colleagues. But if, in case anyone watching this has not seen that episode, you can tell us a little bit about the, your community health center over there. Thank you so much, Hilary. Um, Atira is actually located on the unceded territory of the Muskim, Skirmish, and the Silverton Nations. Um, the organization is a non-profit organization, and uh, we have been in in the support uh, service industry from the last 30 years or so. And our magazine, right, Community Health Center is actually located in the city of Surrey. Uh, we support women who are pregnant and who have younger children. Anybody have a children under the age of 
six months to two years, um, we do the intakes and uh, of the women who are impacted by substance use, past violence from the intimidate partners. We also provide wide range of so supportive services uh, and uh, healthcare services in partnership with the Fraser Health Authority and with the partnership with the Ministry for Children and Family Development. Uh, in order to support this project, uh, we have hired three peer support workers who have to lived in experience to help and connect women for better support services. The implementation of the peer support workers is the measure that Adira has taken to develop both the trust and demonstrate accountability to the program participants and to address any systemic discrimination and empower women that we serve. The peers we select to work with the TIRA programs have the shared lived in experience, um, especially with the women who are assessing our TIRA program and services, which help them to provide a foundation of both trust and inspire them with the honest and empathetic communication. Our Magazine Ride Community Health Center is actually located next to our transition, transitioning house services, which is uh, supportive and transitioning house services. And the peers hired from the community, some of the peers lived in the same community, so it's easy for them to navigate and provide support to the women who assess the services. And our Magazine Ride Community Health Center has partnership with the Fraser Health Authority. We have the nurse uh, on board. Um, who provide support and healthcare services for the women who are assessing the Mexican Community Health Center. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so Thank much you. for all of that information. Um, so as we previously mentioned, previously mentioned, both uh, both of your groups are here um, because of the uh, Systems Navigation Access Partnership Project funding, uh, which is still well underway. Or some people are completing all at different times, and it's been great to see where everyone's at in the different parts of the country. Um, uh, Beverly and Ellen, I'll start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about what you've been able to achieve so far with the SNAP funding and what kind of impact your project is having, especially because you've sort of teased they're going to be able to continue this moving forward. So I'm really excited to hear uh, what you've been up to. Thank you. Um, so there has been actually quite a few achievements and a, a, and a big impact. So I'm just going to go through some of the most important ones. So the first one is that it's improved access between the women and the healthcare provider. And that's for shelter participants and women accessing the drop-in. And there's, it's also spread out into the community because women who have accessed the health practitioners services, word has gone out that it's a safe place. And so more women are showing up at the door and inquiring about that. Um, it's also a trauma-informed non-judgmental services that are offered on site. And there's individual support plans that are made for each individual. So that impacts uh, rapid investigation with testing and procedures ordered. It increases hope for the for potential solutions to chronic health concerns, and it improves access and support in managing medications and improved access access to harm reduction medications. Um, another achievement is women receiving regular connection to our nurse practitioner and the navigator. They feel safer um, by being heard, seen, and cared for. Uh, women are being allowed to take time to share their stories and concerns, um, making more informed choices and participating in their own health needs. And there's a marked decrease in overdose at the shelter as a result of this. Um, the impact can also be decreased experience of stigma and isolation, uh, increase of self-esteem, hope and vitality leading to healthier choices, having a positive experience with a healthcare provider in a safe space, and uh, more willingness to show up for appointments and participate in testing and procedures and following up more regularly. Um, the navigator accompaniment um, to medical tests and procedures, acute emergencies has also been a really big uh, component to the success of this project so far. Um, so we also access not, I also accompany uh, women to non-medical uh, appointments. And this means um, this the impact of this is showing up for themselves in their personal health care. Um, women have reported that when they have an advocate or a witness present in a lab or at the hospital, they feel less fear, anxiety, confusion, and isolation. Uh, with an advocate present, they feel more confident that someone they trust and who knows them can speak for them if they shut down, which they often do. Um, and Indigenous women have said that they feel more comfortable in waiting rooms and talking to the medical staff, and they're more willing to ask for what they need with someone just there with them. 
Um, also the ongoing collaboration with the nurse practitioner. Uh, our services have been able to expand. We're going to have a uh, hep C clinic happening here that will be open to the community. We're also um, initiating a foot care program that will be open to the community. And she has also made available um, individual drug testing strips and also um, PAP tests, self-administered PAP tests, which are hugely pop popular because they're, you know, they're less invasive. Um, you can just do it in private, very simple, very empowering for the women. We've also been creating relationships with other services, uh, agencies, peer groups, community health teams, Indigenous health and cultural services, educational and literacy agencies, um, advocating for deeper understanding of the poison drug catastrophe, substance use disorder, stigma, trauma, and the ongoing impacts of colonization in the residential schools on Indigenous peoples and communities. And that can impact uh, leading to more resources and opportunities offered to the women by making those connections. Um, the program contact within the shelter becomes more varied and accessible. The Indigenous cultural supports have been increased. We now have a residential uh, elder that comes and does blessings, brushings, whatever the women need, um, because we do serve a lot of Indigenous women. Um, the paperwork gets done, the ID gets ordered, uh, alternative learning opportunities are explored, and how, as long with housing choices, alternative housing choices. And changes in attitudes towards homeless women in our community are also, we do, I do a lot of talking about our programs, what we do and how we are and um, yeah, just as much as I possibly can. Wonderful. So there's improved access to the health provider, more needed assessment of concerns. It's just been a very, very good project for us. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Beverly, did you have anything to add? No, not at this time. Thank you. Amazing. Just like to give you a chance, just in case. Um, Sam Reed, if you could tell us how uh, Maxine Wright has been uh, with their, the SNAP project and what you've been able to achieve so far and the impact that it's been having. Thank you so much, Elri. Our peers play a very important role in connecting the women and providing them with the support system. Um, our peers also work closely with not just the Magazine and Community Center, but also with the pregnancy outreach team that are actually connecting women and seeing if, if there are women in the community who are not well aware about the resources available there. Um, also support women needs through the lens of harm reduction, trauma-informed, diversity, and culturally sensitive uh, programming. Our peers come from different backgrounds. So uh, one of our peers speak Arabic, one speaks Spanish. So we are able to support the women who are either new immigrants or refugees. They also help to build the community trust, uh, foster strong relationships between both the peers and community members through consistent engagements and open dialogues. They arrange one-on-one -on -one focus groups to learn more about what, what are the potential needs of these women and also establish trust by ensuring transparency and addressing community specific concerns and providing accurate information about the healthcare system and other resources such as uh, supportive housing, harm reduction. Also, they help to develop easy to navigate educational information resources. They created user-friendly education knowledge and sharing materials in the form of a booklet. And that booklet was designed by the input of the women who are using our services and also with the input of the peers who are able to support these women and connect them with the resources. So that information booklet looks something like that. I don't know if, if you'll be able to see on my screen. Uh, it has a lot of information regarding how pregnant women can be supported by using the service support guide. Uh, this information uh, resource is available at different immig immigration refugee centers and support systems, also in public libraries. Um, also has general assistance and guide for specific BC services such as immigrant support services and programs. Uh, also connect them with the legal assistance if they need that. Uh, connect them with emergency clothing, especially for the new immigrants and refugee women. Also provide them with the guidelines how to enroll themselves for the healthcare system, pathway for the mental wellness and trauma. It also has some roadmaps. Uh, I'm going to put that on the screen to see if you guys can see it, it has a roadmap uh, for the women who are pregnant, who are refugees. Uh, also have a roadmap for women who are pregnant and are indigenous and it's been, uh, roadmap for pregnant women who speak Spanish. 
Wow, what a cool resource. Awesome. But thank you so much. Um, Ellen and Julie, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Um, did you experience any challenges while uh, implementing the new navigation tools and this partnership? Um, and if so, how were they addressed? So I'll, I'll start by saying that the big success for us is that we have a system navigator, <laughs> a person. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and Ellen provides the companion supports for individuals who need it to access their medications, tests, and other services. And um, because of that service being available, these women are better able to access the supports that are available to them. So, um, and, and that's because many of the women who are benefiting from the services have been traumatized in the past by systems and institutions. So having the support for them to be able to navigate these effectively builds confidence and trust and relationship between the individual and the system navigator. Hopefully over time that will build into enough self-confidence that they can access the services on their own if they need to, or they can pay the support forward by helping others at some point in the future. For me, the challenge in talking about this project has come uh, with finding effective tools that track the impact of the project without at the same time violating confidentiality. So, um, and, th and that's because I think the impact can be best demonstrated through stories, but stories can lead to the inadvertent revelation of identifying details. And we live in work in a small town, so the risk is kind of high. So for me, that's like, how do you demonstrate the impact without telling the stories? Statistics only go so far, right? And so um, I, I, think, I think that, you know, what we're trying to do here with the systems navigation is bridge um, the systems that exist to help and the women who have formerly been um, traumatized by those systems. And so how do you bridge and support so that they can each uh, benefit? from from the relationship and that's what ellen does so well absolutely thank you and i would i would assume even from my own lived experience I, when you're asked to share those types of stories anecdotally you're also at risk of re-traumatizing the person that you are asking to anecdotally share so it must be quite difficult to collate that information while trying to do it in a respectful way in a small community so that does sound like quite quite the challenge but we're still so glad that there is Ellen <laughs> um, and that there is a systems navigator to be able to support so that's wonderful um Samreen throwing it to to you and over at Maxine right um what challenges have there been um for your systems navigation project if any um, and how were they addressed? Thank you so much, Elvi. Navigating healthcare system poses a significant challenge, especially for the refugees, immigrant, and the First Nation women, and often exhibiting their vulnerability and compromising their well-being. Uh, we also felt like language barriers are the primary obstacle, especially for the new immigrants and refugees, making it more difficult for them to communicate their symptoms or to where even begin from understanding medical advice and also fill out any necessary intake forms or even for the enrollment into the BC service plan. Uh, culture differences can further complicate in interactions with the healthcare providers. So our system navigators were accompanying these women for those appointments, um, especially for the people who are not too familiar or too sensitive about their backgrounds. Additionally, these women often face systemic barriers such as lack of insurance and familiarity with the healthcare system, limited access to the transportation, fear of discrimination, and the mistress was one of the leading factors, uh, especially stemming from the past traumatic experience that can deter them from seeking any further assistance and health support. Together with these factors, create a very complex web of difficulties, especially for the women who assess these services and must navigate to assess essential healthcare services, highlighting the need for this targeted support and culturally competent care. That's why we had a diversified team of peers who were able to speak multiple languages, able to fill out the forms for these women, and also connect them with services such as food bank. Um, uh, healthcare needs and also connect them with the harm reduction services if they need. Amazing, wonderful. 
Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, now, in terms of successes, I feel like we've already touched on quite a bit of the successes and all of the ways that this has been so important. Um, but Beverly and Ellen, I did want to give you another chance to highlight any other successes, potentially testimonial or any other reasons why this partnership has been so pivotal and important to the community, though I do feel that narration has been throughout and it's very obvious why this was so important to uh, the people that you're supporting out there. Yep, before we move to successes, um, Hillary, I'm just wondering if uh, Ellen could get a chance to speak to the challenges that she faces as the actual systems navigator. Yeah, and also uh, we did consult with the nurse practitioner that we've been working with, and she had some thoughts as well that she wanted to throw into the Absolutely. discussion. Absolutely. Ellen, floor is yours. Thank you. So one of the biggest challenges is the uh, poison drug supply. That we currently have and um, if effectively there is brain injury that happens whether it be like it's unknown whether this would be reversible or not and we've been seeing increased psychosis because they some of the of the analogs that are in the drug supply now include veterinary sedation and uh, lots of benzodiazepines that uh, have all kinds of long-term effects a lot of these women all, all also have chronic health issues on top of that. So um, one of the challenges for me is there are barriers, lots and lots of barriers for women to use substances. There's a lack of essential services available to senior women who use substances. There's a lack of post-detox housing for women. Uh, there's a lack of complex care beds for unhoused women with head injury, complex mental health and addictions. PTSD and survivors of violence and racism. There's just simply, you know, there's a lot of boxes that need to be ticked. And as soon as there that you mentioned substance use, uh, it's untick, it's untickable, and that resource is no longer available. That is very, very frustrating for me. Yeah, that's really common. Understandable. Did you want to also share from the uh, nurse practitioner's perspective as well? Yeah, well, basically, she was the one that it, that was. We both agreed that the that the brain injury as a result of the poison drug supply is number one, and also like most more recently in in Couch and we've experienced an increase in violence. There's they did a great big drug sweep, and um, the drugs have recently changed. And then there was an increase in violence in the community, including here at the shelter, which is very unusual for us. Yeah. So that was a little scary. Um, we definitely noticed that. So that I think is, you know, a really huge issue and it impacts long-term health for sure. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's the number one is the poison drug supply. Understood. Thank you for sharing that. It was very important to hear. Um, pivoting, of course, back to the successes and trying to find that like silver lining in all of this, if there's anything that you wanted to either retouch on or further um, extrapolate on in terms of the, the successes of this partnership. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to share a story. Um, yes. So um, I have a hard time with the word success because it's usually measured through a privileged white lens. Um, but this is a really great story about accompaniment. So I arranged to meet a woman at the hospital uh, that I had a relatively new relationship with. And um, I just was going to be there with her waiting while she had this procedure done. And when I arrived, she was very scared and anxious and felt that the medical staff didn't like her. She, she became very paranoid and agitated. And I asked for permission to speak to them on her behalf. And that resulted in... They gave her a little bit of medication that really helped calm her down. And um, she was, we were able to talk about why she was so anxious. She shared, shared an experience of developing a complication from the same procedure in the past. And she woke up in an intensive care bed in another city. So I asked what would make her feel better in the moment. And she asked me to just rub her back. So I was doing this and the nurse came in, starting to prepare her for the procedure. And she asked the client if she would like me to come into the room with her. And she immediately burst into tears and um, became very upset and said, you, you will hate this. You, you don't, I, don't want any, I don't want you to witness this. This is a terrible thing. And I just reassured her that I was there for her and that if she wanted me to go into the room with her, that I was happy to do that. 
So we went into the room and um, I, I asked her what she wanted me to do while I was there. And she, she asked me to just put, keep my hands on her. So I put my hand on her back, held one of her hands and she went through the procedure. Um, you know, I mean, a procedure, a procedure and she, with all the anxiety. It wasn't an easy experience for her, but when we were in or the recovery you, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. But when we were in the recovery room afterwards, uh, one of the nurses said to me it was the first time that this particular uh, individual had not been combative in the in the room. So uh, I think it was really, really great for her. And then after the fact, she disengaged quite quickly after we went came back to the shelter. And then the next day, she told me that she was embarrassed because uh, she felt that I shouldn't have had to be there. And I just told her, you know, I was happy to be there. And I felt um, happy for her that she was able to work through that fear and do this procedure that was so for important for her health. And in the end, um, she was given a more, much more positive outcome. So it was, it, it, it just helped everything. And it's really bonded us. So now when she's experiencing healthcare stuff, she'll come to me, we talk it through, we try to make a plan, we arrange to, for her to talk to the nurse practitioner, and she feels much more empowered. It's a really great situation. There's lots of stories like that. Absolutely. That trust is so important. And it's also nice to hear from like the the hospital or health, like the the standard health perspective that like without this partnership would be more difficult on them and their resources to have someone be combative as well. So their benefits are across the board from both sides of people that get to experience you being in the room and sort of calming that person down and reassuring them. So it's absolutely perfect success story. Wonderful. Um, Samreen, what about uh, Maxine Wright and you as well? If you have any uh, success stories that you would like to share, any successes um, from the uh, Systems Navigation Project? Uh, yes, I would like to add a little bit. I think so. Our project started sometime back in the fall and winter of the last year. Um, the biggest challenge that we found was the winter peak when we had the snow and our drop-in centers and our shelter places were like full of women. Um, so our peer navigators reached out to other community health centers and they were able to support women and connect them with the other resources available in the community. Uh, mm -hmm. They were able to provide donations of warm clothing to the women. That was not part of the project, but they went above and beyond finding other ways and means to support the women who were assessing the services. And because uh, we are located in the vicinity, which is very close to the new refugees and immigrant uh, services. So some of the women were using our services and uh, we found out that these women didn't have this place to stay safe. So they were using our shelter spaces and shelter beds to stay warm. So our women uh, support workers, what they did is they connected them with the resources in the community, tried to find a safe space for them to stay. I think so that was a huge success because they were going above and beyond what we were asking them to support with and they were figuring out and navigating themselves around the system to see what other resources are there are not just within the data but outside the organization and connecting these women to those services as well. Mm -hmm. well. Um, Beverly and Ellen, curious, we, we've already said that we're going to be able to continue, you know, to have a systems navigator and have Ellen on board, which is so exciting. Um, but maybe if you want to talk through how maybe how evident it became that this partnership wasn't go going to end and how like obviously it's so crucial and if there are any additional plans moving forward um, and how it's going to be able to, I guess, to continue to be sustained. Right. Well, there's lots of questions about all of that, but what we're hoping for is that over time, Couch Women's Health Collective will be able to establish a, uh, like an actual physical community health center. And then at that point, this kind of service would be um, one of our satellite clinics. And then uh, with C-Wave, with we've also discussed establishing uh, additional satellite clinics because they have transitional housing, they have um, shelter for women and their families leaving violent situations. They have a lot of different housing now. Uh, and so they want this kind of service for all of their um, how, uh, clients who are being housed in the C-Wave services. So I think 
I think that the um, the advantage of this, like the, the term system navigator is a really complicated term. It's used in a certain way by health authorities. It's used in a different, you know, it can mean peers. Um, I think we have uh, in Ellen, we have a different kind of a system navigator, somebody who um, works with the women very well, but almost more at the level of a counselor rather than at um, at a peer level. So the it's a unique model, I think, that we have here. And I, uh, I really look forward to seeing how it will evolve over time. Perfect. Ellen, did you want to add anything before we? Well, yes, actually, I would just like to add that I think that that relationship is so vital because I know uh, I used to work in the downtown east side, and one of the things that the women that I work with there um, talked about was just having human contact, mm -hmm. let alone having someone like listen to your stories, uh, you know, and really feel seen and safe. It it just it has a huge impact on their lives and the choices they make. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Samarine, uh, will Maxine Wright be able to continue having their systems navigation project continue? Um, or is there any other different plans um, for the work to be able to be sustained once the project ends? Yeah, thank you so much. Terry. The developed resources will be continue to be shared and used beyond even this project, um, both within the organization and outside the organization with other community partners as well. And the project uh, impact and potentially benefiting a larger population of the women in that area. Um, we had three peer support workers uh, who were working as system navigation and one of them has joined the support worker position and the other one has joined the pregnancy outreach team. Um, so the sustainability and the trust and the connections that they had built with the, these women in the community is going far above beyond this project. The resources will be shared. The, uh, those peer system navigators, they're still around us and they will be continuing doing the same work. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear both of you are going to be able to sustain parts of this project. That's wonderful. Um, Beverly and Ellen, I'm curious, what would increased federal or provincial investment allow for Cowichan uh, to achieve and how would it impact the snap? I mean, you sort of touched on this in the last question. It's all one thread. Um, but how would it uh, impact the SNAP project or the, the continuation of systems navigation? Right. Well, for us, it, it would be about being able to uh, establish this kind of trauma informed and holistic care um, more broadly. So that is our vision. Uh, in 2022, we published a research study called Honoring Women's Voices, where we interviewed um, a lot of women in our community and identified with them what it is they would like to see different. Uh, done differently in healthcare because uh, women are women in general um, have different kinds of healthcare needs uh, because they're often situated in the context of relationships. So, uh, some of the women in our research they talked about when they uh, need to uh, go and see a doctor and they have their doctor's appointment because you have to make that far in advance and so on and so forth. And then on the day, then their child is sick. And so then they have to give up their appointment time to their child or they're taking care of elders and so on and so forth. And one woman in our research study actually said, I think I'm going to get pregnant again because that's the only way I can access holistic wraparound care in our community because we have the Couch and Maternity Clinic here, which um, provides that kind of all round wraparound supports, but only until the baby is a certain age, right? And so it's it's a it's a challenge that um, the healthcare system as a whole doesn't meet the needs of the women in our community, and we are always inspired by like the Atira. Maxine Wright Center and other examples of community health centers where things are done differently. And we're having trouble um, in BC as a whole getting new community health centers off the ground. So I think increased federal and or provincial health care funding would allow a lot more of that. I think there are many medical professionals who would like to work in a more holistic um. Uh, way with communities to address healthcare needs. Uh, they'd like to work in a team-based framework and so on. And so I think all of that would allow us 
um, to do to do more programming and to provide more um, more kinds of supports that actually meet the needs of the community. I think part of the challenge here in Canada generally, but I can speak more specifically to BC, is that poverty is increasing dramatically here. We're up to 25% of the population now is food insecure and so on. And so uh, community health centers can help bridge that kind of um, basic needs with um, healthcare needs. So, you know, one of the points, like it should be obvious, but if people aren't able to sleep or aren't able to eat because of the stresses in their lives of various types, they will have mental health conditions. So if we start by treating the mental health condition, for example, then that doesn't really help because it's not dealing with the underlying issues. And I think that's the advantage of community health centers is to be able to be much more responsive to the entire range of people's needs, um, uh, which include healthcare. Yeah. So that's what I would say in answer to that question, Hillary. <laughs> it's always the most verbose answer because in the, at the end of the day, increased investment would allow for an entire change of the healthcare landscape of our country if we could if we could get it. Um, yes. Serene, I will uh, throw it to you. And from the perspective of Maxine Wright and Atira, what would increased federal and or provincial investment allow for your community health center to achieve or how would it change the outlook of the SNAP project in the future? Definitely increased investment would mean it will able enable us to expand our support services uh, to a broader population. Um, I think so the one part that is missing really is the language assistance and culturally sensitive approach mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. individualized case management based upon diversified need of the women. Um, I think so we need to better address this and provide a diversified range of services, especially for culturally appropriate services using the holistic approach uh, at Magazine Right, We do have one elder who, who provide these services free of cost. Uh, but definitely I believe that having more funding will mean uh, more services and more robust uh, services and approach and mechanisms in place to have these effectiveness in our programs and services that we provide to the women and also help to bring stronger community and stronger health and well-being absolutely i think i think that's almost our motto is like stronger healthier people healthier communities is our is our motto thank you um, i like um sorry um i think it's a pyramid model and the basic services are right down in the pyramid in order to have like a, a well-being and sustainable society we need to focus on the basic needs which is food shelter and uh, appropriate clothing and all these basics needs are met and then we can focus on other areas of the pyramid and hopefully in future we'll be able to achieve that success where we have a well-being a well mental health well-being um, of the community i agree absolutely thank you so much for adding that um and thank all three of you we're, we're we're at the end of the episode thank you all three of you so much um for taking the time to speak with us about your wonderful snap projects and the amazing work that you've been able to do with the funding it is um very inspirational and so wonderful to hear that this you know it's gone to such important needs and um it, that it's such great work is being done um, if anyone listening to this episode would like to learn more about the various associations and programs and people that I verbosely said at the beginning of this episode, um, Beverly, I'll start with you and Ellen. Um, if someone wanted to learn more about Couchen or uh, about Sea Wave or about Cedar Shelter, <laughs> where would they go? Yeah, so Cowichan Women's Health Collective, we do have a website um, because we're 100% volunteer at this stage. We're not uh, keeping it as up to date as we could be, but it's cowichanwomenshealth.org. Um, and then Sea Wave has a very much more uh, up to date uh, website because they have the staffing to do it. And so the information about the Cedar Branches is there on seawave.org, uh, Women's Safe Housing um, page that they have there. Uh, I will commit to drafting up a web page related to this project so that by the time this podcast is released, it'll be on the website. 
No oh, worries. I know. <laughs> that might be a tight turnaround. I told you I move quickly, but I will say that we we have a um a dedicated snap page on our website. So the project is being featured on our website. So you can you can check out our website if you need content for your website, if that'll make your life easier. Um, but thank you so much. Those websites just popped up on the screen through the magic of technology. And um hopefully people will go and check that. Um, and Samreen, where can people learn more about uh, Atira and about Maxine Wright? Uh, so unfortunately, all the educational information and the knowledge sharing materials were in a print form and not available online. But in order to learn more about Atira and our other services, you guys can go on our website, which is www.atira.bc.ca. And in future, we are planning to have more additional resources and information uh, materials available on our website. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you all three of you so much uh, for being here uh, and taking the time to chat with me. And uh, hopefully our uh, listeners are inspired and will go and learn more. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, you, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.